What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Mariana here as always with Tony. And, you know, it's no secret that the fitness industry sucks, period. Whether it's the corrupt multi billion dollar supplement and weight loss industry or the endless supply of influencers promoting anything to drive page views. Bottom line is, we're not trying to provide just another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by providing you with the knowledge and tools to give you confidence in applying the best possible training and nutrition into your own life. And today, we are going to be talking about the top five reasons why you're not losing weight. We are going to dive deep into topics that I don't even think a lot of people think about or consider that hopefully make your weight loss journey more effective and give you the results that you're looking for if you are struggling. Yeah. And before we get into that, as always, a reminder, if you haven't already, to leave us a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening on. This really helps us reach more people and continue to do what we want to do, which is give free education and knowledge and tools in this fitness, nutrition, wellness space to make your lives easier, more realistic. And these really help us reach more people. So we appreciate it. We already have a couple, we have a thousand, over a thousand on Spotify trying to get over there on Apple Podcasts. It just makes our heart beat. (laughs) It makes our heart beat. Thank y'all so much. And if you really like the research aspect that we bring into each and every episode, especially one that we're going to talk about a few today, make sure to join us over on the premium side with Fitness Stuff Premium and the Fitness Stuff Research review where we dive even deeper into specific studies, addressing individual nuances, showing you how to apply each aspect into your own specific lifestyle. And we actually just got done recording this month's AMA or ask me anything episode. So once a month, we also do that where our premium members can submit questions that they want us to dive deeper into, break the research out and really dissect for them. If it's something that we've talked about on the podcast or not, and we've actually got a pretty sick deal going on where the first month's half off. So for just five bucks, You get access to that plus everything else that goes on inside the exclusive discounts with Merrick for blood testing, for example, plus and so much more. But before we get into today's episode that I know we're both excited to quick word from our sponsor, and it's not even a word from them. It's just our word. It's Legion Athletics. (laughs) Shocker. It's been there since the beginning because we love them so freaking much. If y'all have not taken the time to go listen to the episode with Mike Matthews, their CEO please do it where he just pulls back the curtain on the entire supplement industry and how ugly the industry truly is, but why we're so pumped to be able to work so closely and have a great relationship with Legion. Just all research, evidence-backed with an entire review board of PhDs, MDs, and other professionals that vet every single supplement, every single blog post that they put out, which is a huge piece as well. And I know today we're going to be talking about a couple aspects. I think it's a number two or three. We got to ring the bell back, but how massively important protein is in a weight loss or fat loss goal, not just from a physique standpoint to look leaner, more defined, or that special tone zone that people are going for, but protein's huge. Controlling your natural appetite, making it easier to stick to your diet and make it feel like you're not dieting. Their protein, their whey plus, and even their animal protein, or not their animal, their plant-based protein, uh, two massive staples that we both love. I've only had the plant-based once. I stick to their whey just because It's lactose free. It's super easy on digestion. It's extremely high quality and you can get a pretty sick deal on it on their website. You can get 20% off your first order using code FSPOD or FSPOD or double your first points. We'll actually even just leave a link down below in the show notes if you want to go check that out. But let's talk about it. The top five reasons you're not losing weight when you think you should be, when you think you should be, because I think this is something that I've struggled with before. You probably have, and maybe some of you guys are struggling with that right now where you're like, dude, I'm doing everything right. Why am I not losing weight? And I think that usually comes down to, well, if you were doing everything right, you would be losing weight. So there's something there and we got to identify it to move past it today. We each (laughs) made our lists coming into it. We took time to write it down, to bring it up and we collided and they were the exact same lists for (laughs) for what reasons we're getting in the way for all five, and we just changed the order of a little bit. We're both confident that these five reasons, one of them is gonna help you identify what might be getting in the way. Yep. I thought that was yeah. kind of funny that we both had the same freaking list. Tony and I have both experienced at least one of these. I know like sometimes 
you have people and you're wondering like, this is what they know. This is what they do for a living. Like, how could you understand? This shit is hard. Yeah. It's not easy. The principle, yeah, the principle is easy. But being a human being in human nature and the desire and drive to eat food can really make this really difficult. At least one of these we've each experienced and just having that relatability factor there also helps us understand our clients more who we're working with, making it more yeah. effective and realistic. A hundred percent. Yeah. This is not just something that we're like, oh, did a little Googling, <laughs> did a little research and we found out our favorite. It's like, no, I've, I know I personally have ran into probably three of these. And then with at least our one-on-one -on -one clients, at least I've ran into every single one of these. And yeah. these are the most common pieces to do it. And it's frustrating because when you think you should be losing weight and you're not, and you're putting energy and effort towards it, and you yeah. keep not getting the result you want. It is just so, fr it, this sounds lame, but I mean, it's, it sucks. It's disheartening. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes you not want to keep going. So the mm -hmm. goal of this episode is going to be to give you these five so you can hopefully identify. And I think some people are like, oh my gosh, are you kidding? Like we're talking about tracking calories or something like that. They're like, oh my gosh, I got to do another thing. I got to do another thing. You could look at it like that. Or you could say, finally, I know the reason why none of my efforts been working. And now I can use this tool to get past it. And I think that's how I want to preface it of like, you guys should be looking for where you're failing, not yeah. ignoring it. Yeah. I think that's a big one. And I think before we start a little preface that we want to get over before we go into the top five, because we don't want to waste any time there. And if you're a long-term listener of the show, you know our stance on this, but energy balance is king of weight loss. There's nothing that trumps energy balance, energy balance being calories in versus calories out or for weight loss, needing to stay in a calorie deficit. And I know you've heard this a hundred times, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but a quick key for those of you who are unfamiliar, because we actually, I know we started the show off talking about calorie deficits a lot, but I don't think in the last few yeah. months, at least, have we? We try not to be those people that like beat it with a dead horse because. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what we want to do is at least break up what exactly it is so we can identify it because for whatever reason or another, right? A calorie deficit is the single reason that leads to weight loss. And if you've ever seen successful weight loss in yourself or someone else, it's because whatever the method was put that person or put yourself in a calorie deficit that they could or you could sustain for a long enough period of time to elicit weight loss. Every single weight loss study conducted in the last 100 years has concluded that meaningful weight loss requires you to burn more calories. Before that, we just kind of have to understand what a calorie is, because I think that's what most people get a little lost on, right? It's not something you can touch or hold. The calorie is not a thing. It's a unit of measurement and it's how we measure energy, right? And a common analogy we used to use all the time is it's kind of like a mile, right? A calorie is kind of like a mile and it's a unit of measurement, meaning a mile is always a mile. If it's on a horse track, if it's on the beach, if it's up a mountain, a mile is always a mile, regardless of the contents inside of it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a calorie is the quality of what feeds and what makes up these calories can be different. If you have nutrient dense food versus ultra processed or junk food, but regardless, at the end of the day, a calorie is just measuring the amount of energy that is held inside of that. And this comes back down to the first law of thermodynamics. This is not just like a theory. This is a phys like a physical law. And you just can't beat those, kind of like gravity. It just kind of yeah. applies to everybody. The first law of thermodynamics says energy cannot be destroyed nor created, only transferred. And how does that relate here? Now that we know calories are measuring energy, this makes sense right? You can only transfer energy in and out. You can't just create energy out of nothing and you can't just destroy it out of mm -hmm. nothing. So that's where this principle just lies true. So the five keys that we're going to go over here today are all using this as like the foundation, the bedrock, Yeah, I yeah. think would be the best way to put it, right? It's, this is yeah. the foundation. We're not just guessing. We're assuming this is true to build up the next five. And it's also important because I know we're going to we, it's inevitable to usually get this is, you know, well, we're not systems. A calorie we're, is measured in a bomb calorimeter. Human beings are not that. No, they absolutely are not that. But it doesn't mean that this principle does not apply to human beings. We have more inputs that throw off this system, and mm -hmm. which is why this is more difficult for some people than others. But it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to everyone. You see a lot yes. now. Well, you know what? What if what if I am a di type 2 diabetic? It's more difficult for me because I can't comp control my blood sugar. Absolutely. There's no denying that. Mm -hmm. But this law still has to apply in order for you to lose weight. Yes. How you that get so there important. is going to be a little different. 
but a hundred percent. And I think that's where you, I mean, you put the nail on the head. A lot of people think, Oh, I have Hashimoto's. I have thyroid. I have something else. Those things can change the circumstances and can make achieving this more challenging, but it doesn't mean that the principle is not there in the first place. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think that's what we got to understand. And these five reasons are going to be reasons of why you're not achieving this in the first place too. So the principle is the bedrock. That's the foundation. So let's go ahead and start off with number one, which I would say is probably the most common that I see. I don't know if you would agree with that, but the most common I see, number one, end of day, and this is the frustrating pill to swallow, you're underestimating how many calories you're eating or consuming. Mm -hmm. You're just underestimating how many calories you're consuming at the end of the day. And there's a lot of reasons why this could be that we're going to jump into, but that just I would you say that's the most common? I would say nine out of 10 times. I'd say this is probably what gets most people. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just talking with Tony, telling him this story beforehand, but like I just experienced this last night when I was, I measured out my rice. I weighed out my rice and my boyfriend was standing next to me and like, I went to add in a little bit extra and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, well, I don't know. He's like, (laughs) But that's going to be more, isn't it? And again, we've had this conversation. Like he is uh-huh. such a great supporter, helps me stay accountable. Like I love that. And I just started cracking up. I was like, oh my goodness. In my head, I was just like, eh, what's, a, what's a little bit more? But I subconsciously, I'm, I'm like, how did, why would I do that? Now that yeah. I know I just did that, why? So I just think it's really common to do. There's more technical reasons also. That yeah, we'll it's, it's on that. autopilot. Almost. Yeah. Right. Like your brain was on autopilot. And and that's just because it comes down to this. And we're not saying that you have to track calories to be in a calorie deficit. That's not what we're saying at all. But in this case, it's where a lot of people run into frustration because they're like, okay, I get it. I'm going to be in a calorie deficit. I'm going to track. I'm going to track. But you have to remember calories tracked does not automatically equal calories consumed. Mm. Okay. It's kind of like the the budgeting analogy, which I think calories in, calories out is a little more complex than just a simple budgeting strategy. But if you were going to save money to put a down payment on a house and you're like, okay, I need to tighten up my finances. I really need to budget and pay attention to my spending and my income. That makes perfect sense. And if you want to optimize this to save, you're going to track everything that you have coming in and everything that you have going out. But just because you're tracking, it doesn't mean necessarily that's what's going in and out. That's like, what if you're just skipping over, let's say food, because you're tracking most of the big expenses. You're tracking your rent, you're tracking your car payment, you're tracking maybe an expensive gym membership, but you're like, you know, it's only Chipotle once or twice a week. It's only 15 bucks here or there. Is it really gonna make a difference? It's like, if you're budgeting in the end, it really adds up. And I pulled this one, it's a really cool study we talked about, I think it was our first one or two podcasts, but not since then. And it was from researchers at Columbia University College. And it was, I thought one of the most fascinating studies that changed my perspective on this. They did a study with 224 overweight individuals who reported only eating about 800 to 1200 calories per day, but they were still struggling to lose weight, which if you're an overweight individual, you naturally are going to be burning a lot more calories for the day. You should be dropping weight almost automatic if you were only eating 800 to 1200 calories per day. But what this study did is they followed these individuals around to accurately measure what they were eating. And they found, and this is the number that just blew my mind. They found that on average, These individuals were under-reporting their calorie intake by 2,000 calories per day, meaning they thought they were taking in close to 1,000, when in reality, they were taking in over 3,000 per day. This is not a little bit. That's easy enough to to erase a deficit, but a lot of these individuals were self-diagnosing with Hashimoto's or a broken metabolism, thyroid disease, all these different things and reasons why they're not losing weight, when at the end of the day, it's because they just weren't actually taking in what they thought they were. And I don't think these people were probably liars. I don't think they were just blatantly lying. I think it's, they really thought they were. And that's because tracking calories, like you said, it's hard and it takes a lot of Mm self-accountability. It's like learning a new language almost. Yeah. Yeah. And also I feel like it's common for people to think, and this could go under this category of if you are more overweight, you should not be eating significantly less. Your body is already eating more energy, your deficit is not going to be into 1500 calories a day. People will think that someone eating 2200 calories in a deficit and you're extremely overweight is impossible. No, Mm -hmm. that, that is, you know what I mean? Depending on the person, but people are so quick to judge how much someone who was overweight eating a certain amount of food when they say they're in a deficit, 
when really this is actually how much you should be eating. Like, yeah. you don't have to go that low because, again, oh, yeah. it makes it a lot easier to underestimate. Well, and especially for people that are really overweight, their weight fluctuates so much more than lower weight individuals on just a day-to-day basis. So it's like the problem of thinking you're not losing weight because of a fluctuation up or down is even more present there. So they might think they might need to put like a little more, push their foot on the gas a little bit more when you're exactly right. I mean, I've had clients before, and this is not uncommon where they're in like the three, four hundreds and they are losing three to five pounds a week eating 28 to 3,200 calories a day. That's a lot of food. But to them, they're larger individuals. So that puts them in a big deficit just because they are burning through so much more than they think. And that's going to help them stay more consistent than just chopping it down to 15, 1200, whatever the low thing might be. So that was a perfect point. And I think in this scenario too, just when we talk about tracking, and I know we've talked about how you don't need to track a hundred times before, but tracking can be challenging for a number of reasons. I didn't use that analogy lightly when I said it's like learning a new language. It is challenging to learn how to track. And there's a few things that kind of get in the way if you are tracking, which, and this is that annoying part at the end where you're like, you're rolling your eyes and you're like, I've been tracking food for a month. It's not working. And now you're telling me I've been doing it wrong this whole time. It's like, well, this should be good news because now you know where the pitfall or that trap door is. And I think the biggest one I see is the fact that if you're not, and this sucks, if you're not using a food scale, you can guarantee that your food's not going to be super accurate. A food scale is really the most accurate way to do things. If you're just eyeballing serving sizes or even using measuring cups, you could be missing out on hundreds and hundreds of calories every single day. Mm -hmm. And that can suck because I don't know about you. I'm not going to like sugarcoat this. Using a food scale for everything is not fun. It's annoying as hell. (laughs) It's not fun. But it's one of those things where it might be worth dialing in for the first few weeks, measuring on a food scale. So you're more confident in what certain servings look like. Yeah. That's usually how I like to use it is more of a tool for the first couple of weeks. And especially if you're not in contest prep and need to be meticulously weighing out every single thing that goes in your body, which most people aren't, you don't yeah. need to use a food scale long term, but at least to dial in the accuracy because the accuracy is, yeah. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. That's and huge. like the reality is weighing everything that goes into your mouth is so not sustainable and no using it as a temporary tool, which so many people don't, which is why it leads to this really unhealthy relationship Mm -hmm. with tracking and feeling like it's taking over your life, which is expected because it can, is this is going to help me understand how much I should be eating, what this type of portion looks like for me right now, instead of just going in blind, you know, Mm. looking at it as a temporary tool And there's certain things that, you know, that's not going to be the most exciting and that's okay. You shouldn't try to enjoy tracking your food, but getting yourself in a good position where, you know what, I know this is only temporary. I want to pay attention now so that I can really understand what my serving size look like so that in the future, I'll be able to make this decision on my own. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think this is where the next most frustrating part is. You're using a food scale. You're doing all this. Don't hate the player, hate the game. The game sucks. I think this is something that you brought to my attention initially first, but most people don't recognize this. And especially this is more present in prepackaged food versus more whole foods that you would yeah. buy. But food manufacturers can underreport calories by up to 20% and still pass FDA inspection. I think this is what you brought up to my attention yeah. first. So yeah. the calories on your label, just because you, you weighed it out, you did everything perfect. That piece is out of control too, where again, this is going to be like on the fringe this isn't going to, the food labels aren't going to be the one thing that's stopping you from losing weight. It's not that big of a deal, but it's still just to show like it's, it's not an exact science. Even people who are tracking everything to the freaking gram that goes in their mouth at the end of the day, you can still guarantee they were probably a little bit off just because of that fact. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that one got me because I didn't know that was allowed until you brought that to my attention. It is crazy. And you just think about there's a lot of deception, not only in marketing on these foods, but also in what they're reporting. So yeah, it's a small piece of the puzzle. And hopefully you're not only eating foods out of a package. I mean, especially it will make your journey a lot more difficult. Mm -hmm. I think that also can kind of tie into another fact under this is that eating just because you're eating healthier doesn't mean that you're eating for weight loss. So Mm -hmm. A lot of times, you know, 
you'll hear, I'm eating so healthy. I am eating so good. I'm yes. eating the gluten-free foods. I'm eating the low-fat foods. I'm eating the – this. I ordered the salad when I was out. There's nothing wrong with that happening to you. Uh-huh. It's normal for that to happen. But there's this issue a lot of the times in marketing and just in our society, there's not a clear enough distinction between – eating healthy, I say in quotation marks, and eating for weight loss. Yeah. I want to elaborate on that a little bit. I think that nails the head on because that was, you know, we were talking about the tracking issues and the hard part of tracking. A lot of people who choose not to track are just like, okay, you know what? I'll just eat clean, like quote unquote, mm-hmm. I'll eat clean or I'll eat healthy. And this is exactly that point where just because you're eating healthy, that doesn't overlap entirely with eating for weight loss. It doesn't. And I even pulled this up because this, this stat always cracks me up. But let's say you go out to like the Cheesecake Factory. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to eat healthy today. You order the barbecue ranch chicken salad. That's 2,100 calories, over 2,100 calories because you order the salad. Granted, right. serving sizes at the Cheesecake Factory are oh, It can feed a family. It can feed a family. <laughs> but still, it's like it just it doesn't overlap where calorie intake, like that that principle, that foundation that we're speaking on. If you're consuming too many calories, it doesn't matter if it's from lettuce and carrots. It doesn't Mm -hmm. matter if it's from soda or McDonald's or anything in between. If you're consuming too much of anything, you won't lose weight, period, the end. And I think that's a perfect point of where people get frustrated. It's like, well, I'm eating so clean. I'm eating healthy. And it's just the scale is not moving. And that's not to discount eating whole nutrition foods at all. No, no. It's going to make your journey so much easier. Because that also can help help you on your journey eating more whole foods than processed foods. And that is like the piece of that we'll get into when we talk about protein, hunger, all of that. But Mm -hmm. also now you, you see so many people saying, giving like healthier, like swaps and foods that you should avoid versus foods you can buy. And you'll see someone saying like, instead of getting chips, ahoy, get this almond flour, coconut sugar, organic cookie. That is labeled as being healthier, or labeled as being keto or whatever. Yeah. And people will choose that. Mind you, nine times out of 10, the calories are either going to be similar or that healthier version, I'm saying in quotation marks, typically has more calories because it's using either coconut oil, it's using yeah. almond flour versus regular. So at, at the end of the day, what are you? what purpose are you actually – serving. Mm -hmm. Like there's a time and place to have Chips Ahoy and actually have the real thing. And then there's a time and place to have foods that are good for you and also going to aid on your weight loss journey. Don't make it. And and those categories overlap. There are quote unquote what people, because we don't like the the unhealthy versus healthy terms, but there are quote unquote healthy. (laughs) Yeah. There are quote unquote healthy were like foods that overlap with weight loss, but it's not entirely, they don't stack on top of each other. And I think that's Mm -hmm. massively important. The funny video that that reminded me of is the one comparing those famous, like the Lenny and Larry's protein cookies, like the vegan plant-based protein cookies to like yeah. a Snickers bar. And it's like, you would lose a lot more weight just eating Snickers bar than this Lenny yeah. and Larry's cookie. Which, mm-hmm. and, yeah. and before we move on to number two, that is, and we'll get into this a little bit later too, the quality of your food matters massively. If you're just eating crap, thinking you can stay in a calorie deficit, like I know the, the famous example is Professor Mark Hobbs, right? The Kansas State professor head of nutrition. We talked about that a while ago, right? He was at the mm-hmm. Twinkies and gas station diet where he ate in a calorie deficit, I think 1800 calories a day for 10 weeks, eating nothing but gas station food, like Twinkies, protein oh, yeah, shakes yeah. and things there. And he lost 27 pounds in 10 weeks and all of his blood markers improved. That would be a nightmare because guess what? If you're hungry already taking less energy in and you're just giving yourself ultra processed foods that do not fill you up, it's going to be absolute hell sticking to yeah. This yeah. diet, like quality <laughs> foods, higher in fiber, vitamins, minerals, proteins, that's going to make it 10 times easier. So we're not just saying screw what you would consider a healthy food and just go to McDonald's yeah. and just eat in a deficit. We're just saying you're still not going to lose weight Yeah, if you're not in a deficit. So number one is you're underestimating how many calories you are consuming. What's number two? Number two would be you're overestimating how many calories you are burning. Oh. And- I think this can go, this happens often. You really see when people will account for, you know, well, I did 30 minutes of cardio today and I burned this many calories. So I'm going to add that into my fitness pal so I can eat more. This is the first thing I think of at least. A hundred percent. And a mistake I had made when I first started out, not realizing that when you're calculating how 
many calories you should be eating, you're already taking into account the mm -hmm. calories you may be burning at during exercise. So people just doing endless amounts of cardio and then yep. saying, oh, I can, I can eat more. Not, not, that's not how that works. Um, it's easy to eat that, eat those calories back. It's so easy yeah. to eat those back. Yeah. I think the next logical step in someone's head is like, okay, they finally accept the point. Like I got to be in a calorie deficit. That's, I just got to do it. And people get to that point, they realize it. And then when they look at like options, when it comes to training, they're like, okay, well, an hour of cardio is going to burn a lot more calories than an hour of weight training. So I should obviously choose that because the goal is to create a calorie deficit. So that makes total sense. If you're looking short term, if you're looking at the right now, that makes total sense. This is where I think a lot of people see the problem in fitness is the more you zoom out, the less that works out. Yeah. You know, I think that's the big problem because it's, it's true. An hour of any sort of cardio that you're going to do is likely going to burn significantly more calories than just an hour of lifting weights. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but that's a problem long-term. And we've talked about this a few times. I know, and I, I really had to plug this, this study again. I, I brought back the bangers, three from the beginning <laughs> episode, but the one from the researchers at the West Virginia University, and this is the one that was done over six weeks. It was insane because they, they separated individuals into two groups and they put both groups on a very low calorie liquid diet a VLCLD. Mm, and yeah. It was of 800 calories a day, but they had to, to control for the extremely low calorie intake, because if they just said eat 800 calories, they know people aren't accurate at what they're tracking. They know that people aren't going to stick to it. So that's why they assign these people very low calorie liquid diets. And over the course of six weeks, the only difference between the two groups is that group one did four, one hour cardio sessions per week, while group two did three, one hour weight training sessions per week. That's the only difference. And at the end of the study, it was a six weeks. At the end of the study, the cardio group lost the most weight. They lost the most body weight, but they also lost nine pounds of lean body mass and their resting metabolic rate decreased at the end of those six weeks. So they lost nine pounds of lean body mass and their resting metabolic rate decreased. The weight training only group didn't lose the most weight, but they lost the most fat they lost no lean body mass from start to finish of the study and their resting metabolic rate actually increased by 15%. So if we look at these two groups at the end of the study, who do you think is going to maintain the progress they made longer? The person who is now burning less calories, just sitting at rest, the cardio group or the group who actually increased and still has that lean body mass working for them. And this is obviously, this is a black and white study where it's cardio or weights when obviously a combination of both is going to be better, but mm -hmm. it's just that weight training has such a powerful effect on maintaining and building lean body mass, which is so massively, who cares? You'll look sexy. You'll feel great. That's awesome. Cause it will happen with more muscle, but you're not taking into account that metabolic impact that muscle has just being maintained, right? Yeah. You're burning so much more and it has such a larger impact on your resting metabolic rate, which it just gives you so much more flexibility because like we talked about before, weight loss doesn't happen over the course of like days to weeks. It happens over months and years. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to put up with the cardio and the dieting and stuff like that for a few weeks, but who cares? Because you can't maintain that for the next yeah. couple of years. I yeah. think that's the biggest piece people understand or don't mm -hmm. understand. In yeah. That. And, and it really like, I think you can even say, we said number two was overestimating how many calories you're burning. You can also say like coupled with that is prioritizing cardio over strength training. I feel like we don't want to make that a completely separate one because it, mm -hmm. it flows into this. But if you feel like you're not the person who's overestimating your calories, you understand that, yeah, cardio is already accounted for. I'm not adding that in. I'm not only using a fitness tracker to guide how many calories I'm burning. Another piece could be, well, are you strength training at all? Yeah. How, how much are you preserving your lean muscle mass? Are you only doing cardio? Because that can really affect your progress in the long term. Yeah. Well, I think people often forget. I think we did this in a previous episode, which I know we're going to reference like a hundred different episodes here, but we're piecing it together. <laughs> but just that your body adapts to cardio so much quicker than it does mm -hmm. to weight training. And it's harder to progress in cardio than it is to just implement progressive over overload in weight training. To where, and this is something you would see all the time in those hit classes, the orange series, the F45s, where, yeah, it's going to tell you how many calories 
you're burning based on your what heart rate and maybe your weight and height. That's it. How many calories your body's burning through all the different metabolic processes is so much more complicated than just your heart rate, weight, and height. Yeah. It's so much more complicated. And people forget, even though if you've been doing the same workout for six months, and this is when I used to work at one of those gyms, if you've been doing it for six months, it's going to tell you that you're still burning the same amount of calories if your heart rate and everything's still the same, but your body is not. Mm -hmm. Your body down regulates those quick. And what cracks me up, and I had to pull these stats up because I remember I was talking about this on a couple of different events and then even on social media about just how massively inaccurate calorie trackers are, oh like an gosh. Apple Watch, the, the things that are on your wrist, because people will swear and die by these. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, I know this, they won't even stop their workouts until they reach like a certain number mm -hmm. of calories burned, which I get it from like a psychological, like a motivational standpoint, but it's funny because they're just so massively inaccurate. And we pulled this from the Stanford researchers. They tested seven different wrist worn devices. They found that these trackers overestimated calories burned by up to 43%. Yeah. Meaning if the tracker said you burned 500, you could have burned as little as 285 nearly half of a calorie. So if you're counting on that to say, oh, well, I can eat X amount more a day because I burned this many calories, but you burned almost half of that. Guess where that deficit's going to go? Bye. It's not yeah. there anymore. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's so much more complicated. And that's why, and people will, came after me, I know for this, because they were like, oh, well, that was a study conducted in 2017. It's like, that's not why these these tracker, the the, the tracking devices have gotten more and more like technologically advanced over the years. Yeah. But that doesn't change the fact that your sleep, your lean body mass and muscle tissue, your stress, your endocrine and hormone function, dozens of different things go into calculating how many calories your, your body is burning that that little watch, no matter how great the tech is, is just it not will, paying attention. To it those. will never get there. And I think that's what people don't understand is yeah. that method of determining your BMR or your, mm -hmm. not your BM, well, your BMR also is what it will account for, but yeah. your total daily energy expenditure is really what it's doing. How many calories you've burned in, in a day. That's going to be one of the least accurate methods because you cannot calculate the, the, the CO2 that you're expelling, yeah. which is a marker of measuring, you know, your TDEE, the, yeah. the gold standard of doing that is in a bod pod. What's another one? I think it is the water displacement. The gold standard methods will always be the gold standard methods because of how you can accurately detect how much energy you are burning in a day. And that's never going to be possible through a fitness tracker. It's, it's just not, it would have to be very invasive if so. Yeah. Yeah. Like it would almost <laughs> have to be like my little, my diabetic monitor that just is constantly in like injected into my body. It would almost have yeah. to be on that level, which even then they'd have a, such a difficult time monitoring <laughs> those and few controlling things. Controlling for every single person's differences and their metabolic rate and <laughs> lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Cause tr like, trust me, I've had an Apple watch before. I love the whole match with your friends, complete your rings. Who's completing their rings. How many I days never in a row. use mine anymore. It feeds into it, especially if you're one who uses the tracker. The reason number two, if you're not underestimating how many calories you're eating, you might be overestimating how many calories you are burning yeah. in a day and through training for those several reasons. Now, should we feed that into number three? Yeah. What's number three? Number three. So number one, you're underestimating how much you're eating. Number two, you're overestimating how much you're doing. Number three is you're just not moving enough through the rest mm -hmm. of the day. Remember that you have 23 other hours outside the hour in the gym a day, 23 other hours <laughs> compared yeah. to the one hour in a gym. You, you're probably just not moving enough. And mm -hmm. I know this is something you and I have dug in a lot more over the last year, especially with our, yeah. I know with clients and on the show, right? Yeah. And it's just that yeah. little stinking thing called neat, our little yeah. neat, right? We break down the, your TDEE, your total daily energy expenditure, where you burn calories in a day. We've broken that down a dozen times and people often forget the most, malleable, moldable piece of that is your non-exercise activity or that non-exercise movement. And a lot of people, and I know we do, we would place your daily step count in this. And I know we've done an entire episode on step count, but your workout, no matter how intense it is or how many calories your tracker says you burned, it's still at the end of the day is only probably one to one and a half hours. Yeah. You have 23 other hours in a day. And I know one of the biggest things, at least 
and this is more anecdotally, don't have any hard data to support this, but with my one-on-one -on -one clients, before even thinking about adding cardio in, the first week that we say, hey, let's look at your step count. Dang, we're around 4,000, maybe 5,000. Let's increase it to eight, nine, 10. Boom, does the scale start moving fast? Yeah. Yeah. So freaking fast, just because we slowly increase how much you're moving through the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. You can't yeah. be sitting down. It's absolutely massive. I just had one of my clients ask yesterday, hey, when should I, when should I know when I should go lower in my deficit? And he's been consistently losing mm -hmm. one pound a week. So first of all, I said, well, we're not even there yet because we don't need to go lower. You're losing yeah. at a consistent and it, yeah. sustainable rate. But say you were at a plateau. The first thing I would look into is not lowering your calories. 100%. I would look into increasing your movement throughout the day through your step count. We do that first so you can still eat more, especially if you mm -hmm. are more sedentary. Let's do that first and also help keep our hunger at bay because we're not throwing in this like intense cardio. And let's see if that changes. And with a lot of people, that is really, really helpful, especially when the majority of people who work a nine to five or are sitting in school all day. Mm -hmm. You have to be really, really, you have to put a lot of effort into thinking about yeah. it. I'm not just saying that that's easy to do. Oh, yeah. But being strategic about it. Yeah. Well, especially, I know this is a common. I don't know if you've experienced it. We're just airing all of our clients out. <laughs> no, we're talking about a lot of these client stories, but it's really common. We're coming out of the winter months of the year when it tends to be colder, cloudier, where just going on a 10, 15, 20 minute walk. Look who's talking, San Diego. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. I can go on a walk whenever I want. I can go at five in the morning in the shorts and a t-shirt and I'll be hunky-dory 99% of the days of this year. But that's what I'm saying. For most of the country coming out of the winter months, it's not so easy. I mean, in half of the freaking country, like it seems like this winter time, it was a heavy snow winter. There's three feet of snow on the ground. You're just going to say, go outside and walk 20 minutes. No, screw that. Abs even though you'd probably burn a lot more calories going yeah. through three feet of snow, but same thing. It's not an easy concept to do, but you have to remember how important it is. And exactly to your point, that's the one thing whenever it's like, okay, should we cut calories lower? That should be the last thought in your head. You should always say, where can I maximize how much we're burning in a day. Yeah. And the biggest piece there outside of like looking at your BMR, outside of looking at your, like the thermic effect of food or eating enough protein outside of exercise is look at your step count. Mm -hmm. Look at your movement. Cause if that's low, I mean, and this comes down to a personal choice. Cause I've talked to people like this one-on-one -on -one all the time and you kind of give them a choice. We could lower your calories by a few hundred, or we could just add three 10 minute walks, you know, one after each meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, just go on a 10 or 15 minute walk, which would you rather have eat the same amount of food, but add some short walks or lower your calories a few hundred. And I think the vast majority of people would say, screw eating less. I'll go on a couple walks because no one wants to eat less food. Yeah. yeah. It's huge. I just had, I just thought of something too, like, especially in the times when you can't go for a walk, I, another one of my clients, we were just chatting about yesterday how that's that's a barrier. The weather is a barrier for walking. And yeah. this is going to depend on the person, but I asked this individual about how often they do chores around the house and kind of what that schedule is like. And if there would be room to add in, whether it's like every other day or if you could do it every day during the weekday, a chore that might, might take you 20 to 30 minutes that requires you to be on your feet even. This, this individual sits all day long. Okay, well, maybe the next step because of the weather can't be to go outside for a walk. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a, a gym you can get to to get on a treadmill, let, let's get on our feet, do a standing chore. That factors into your neat. Same for 20 to 30 minutes and see if we could get that into a routine. So getting creative yeah. about it. Sometimes you just got to do it. <laughs> There's a million different solutions to where you can do it. It's not just mm -hmm. go outside and walk. There's a hundred excuses that we could use that are very valid, like weather, yeah. like snow, like all these big things. That's another big reason. And again, we're not saying you have to go force yourself to walk. We don't say you have to force yourself to do chores, but if you're not losing weight, when you feel like you're tracking your calories, right, you're not overestimating what you're burning, you might just be sedentary. And that makes it so much more challenging. I know, you, and you can even tell this if you go on like any TDEE calculator online, which we know the calculators, they're not meant to be the most accurate things in the world, but they're always a good starting place of a rough estimate. So you could then improve on that after you yeah. look at the feedback. But even if you go to 
any accurate TDEE calculator, if you type in what's one of the most important questions they ask you, what's your activity level like? Mm -hmm. Is it light? Is it moderate? Is it heavy? Is it big? What does your activity outside of the gym look like? And if you notice, if you just want to go through a calculator and click the different levels and not change anything else, your height, your weight, your goal, anything else, but you only change how active you are, you could end up eating. I've seen anywhere from 800 to 1200 more calories per day, just yeah. based on your activity level, which mm -hmm. 1200 calories is another pretty large meal. Yeah. That 1200 calorie meal is huge. Yeah. And that can be added on top just by looking at your activity level. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that goes understated. It's going to require effort depending on the nature of your day to day. This process requires a lot of effort. So it's about in your lifestyle, where this could be the most malleable, where you can make the most effective change and where you're willing to make those sacrifices sometimes in terms of the time that maybe you wake up or the time you spend taking a break from the work you're doing, kind of how you're using your time in a day where you have free time. Doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's easy, but that's the reality of this process is sometimes you're going to have to make some sacrifices for it to become a habit you want to continue mm. doing and it to not feel like it's a sacrifice anymore. There's been like three times through this too, where it's like the stuff we're saying sounds so cliche. I want to kind of throw up, but it's so freaking true. It's so easy coming from us, especially to sound like, oh yeah, that's just so easy when I have kids and I'm working a nine to five and I'm stressed and I'm tired and I still have to meal prep and worry about all of these things. Sometimes I feel like it just sounds like so unrealistic. Sometimes it is unrealistic because everyone's yeah. life is so complicated and different than the next person. So that's what we're saying. The goal of this episode is not to say, do all these things. It's just, hey, if you're struggling with this problem, here's a potential solution. Like here might be what is that trap door that you just keep falling into that you just can't see. Yeah. That might be one yeah. of it. Now that kind of goes hand in hand with number four that we put on this list, right. right? So number one is underestimating how many calories you are consuming. Number two is overestimating how many you're burning. Number three is that you're just not moving enough. What's number four? Number four is the rest of your lifestyle sucks. And sucks, don't take bro. that personally. There's aspects of your lifestyle that you are just not considering paying attention to at all. And hey, maybe all of these things I'm about to list, list off are perfect for you, but I highly doubt it. One being sleep, stress, Ooh. alcohol consumption, whether that's on the weekends, throughout the week. Fourth, your mental health. Personally, I find this one to be so, so, so impactful for the motivation piece, right? Like me sitting here, I have depression. Sometimes in the winter, like getting out of bed, like I would rather sleep for the rest of my life. That's the nature of depression sometimes. And depending on what generation you're in, sometimes people will look at that as an excuse. But okay, if this is the factor that is really affecting me the most. It's making me not be able to mm -hmm. go for a walk before work or go to the gym. How can I work on this piece so that I can actually implement these habits that I already know I'm capable of doing and have the resources yeah. to do? The rest of your lifestyle, people just forget about that. And I think that goes a little bit back into the whole calories in versus calories out. The first place everyone looks is calories in. How much less food do I need to eat to lose weight? And not the rest of it. And again, even if they do choose to look at how many calories they're burning in a day, they usually just look at one thing and that's exercise, which we already know is the smallest chunk of calories you're burning in a day compared to the thermic effect, the, the calories you burn digesting your food, that non-exercise movement and your BMR, which so many of these things, your sleep, your stress, your lean body mass, all these things play into your BMR, which makes up 50 to 70% of the calories you burn in a day. And you got so many people who... And it's hard to pinpoint this. We don't have any specific research to say, oh, if you improve your sleep, you will burn X more calories per day. It's not something that you could really control for, but you notice such a massive difference in how easy or hard weight loss or any body composition, even if you're trying to build muscle, is when your sleep is good versus bad, or if your stress is under control versus out of control because yeah. of the havoc that wreaks on your body, your endocrine and hormone health, your immune system. It just makes things so much easier, especially coming from like a muscle building standpoint. If you're not sleeping at night, that's when your body is physically building that muscle. Who cares how much time you spend in the gym? Who cares about your diet? If you're not sleeping, you're not going to make progress when it comes to building muscle. 
Yeah. It's just not happening. Your lifestyle pieces that people, you know, it's, I wish it was as easy as just diet and training, <laughs> but it's not. You got to paint the whole picture. This is the piece where like, yeah, Tony and I like to provide evidence where we can as much as off we can as as often as we can. And we are very analytical about a lot of things. But this piece right here, you don't need to throw out a study to say, if you're exhausted, you're not going to be able to put as much effort into your workout or even get to the gym. You know, yeah. if you're extremely stressed to the po point where it's debilitating and your cortisol levels are chronically elevated, you may not be able to control your binge eating or your boredom eating or your emotional eating because it's filling that gap, that void. If you are drinking every single night and that lowers your inhibitions when it comes to food, mm -hmm. it's going to make it harder to, all these things are going to make it more difficult to lose weight, right? You don't need some study to show that at least one of those things, you know, maybe you can relate to most people can, I think, especially the tired piece. When you're tired, you're a different person. <laughs> oh my God. I was just having this conversation. I got the highest aura sleep score I have in a while. I got a 92. Oh, mm -hmm. it was a really good night's sleep. But it's like for the difference for me when I get a great night's sleep versus a really bad night's sleep. And this is just, I attribute this to work, but it could be with anything is like, you know, those tasks that sometimes you just dread and you put off and they're not that big of tasks, but it makes a bad night's sleep makes tasks that are like the size of a pebble into the size of a mountain. Oh, yeah. And you're like, screw this. I can't even touch this. It's like this. And if I get a good night's sleep, it turns into a pebble that you could just kick out of the way. Yeah. Every task becomes easier. Motivation becomes easier. All those things become easier. So it's like, it's the paint your whole picture. And I think that's reassuring. I know it can be frustrating to some people. It's like, what the heck else do you want me to pay attention to? I'm tracking my food. I'm going to the gym. Why is there so much more? But I feel like you should use that as comfort to where it's like, you're unique. Your lifestyle is unique. And mm -hmm. okay, this is about, I'm about to like almost regret saying this because this is the most cliche thing we're going to do today. It's not a diet. It's a lifestyle, but it's, <laughs> it's like, no. look at your freaking life. If all these things yeah. are out of control, good. It doesn't fit, right? Your life is unique and you got to fit it all and mold it. And that's, I think the cool part is when you have so many things that go into it, you can be really flexible. What things do you want to go really hard on? What things do you want to go a little bit more relaxed on? right? Do you want to track and weigh every calorie that goes in your body? Or do you want to nail your sleep and your stress? So you have a lot more flexibility when it comes to that. You know? Yeah. I'm going to give another client story again, but a repeat <laughs> client actually who decided to not continue for, you know, reasons, mental health, emotions, life, life happened, you know, and mm -hmm. now this individual is a repeat client. We're working together again. And this person came to me and said, you know what? I don't want to track right now. I'm not in a position to because my sleep sucks and my job is getting to me and I want to learn mm -hmm. how to change my mindset. The first month, my first thought, it, it is to think about you. We got to consider calories, but we also have to consider lifestyle. That's the first time that someone has come back and like, yeah. hey, this is why this, I didn't get everything out of it because I wasn't there. And yes. now I need to put in the work to be able to get there. First, I got to cover my sleep and my stress. Like, mind <sighs> loving. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It's like in the first part, it's like if your lifestyle sucks, you're just not in a place where you can probably handle the rest of it. Yeah. And what does that equal? That means it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if you can't hit your cat, whatever. If that piece isn't there, it's just not going to work. Same thing with like your mindset and your goals. Like if you're half in it, you're probably not going to make it to the end anyways. But that sounds like a perfect experience of, yeah, it's like we keep trying and trying and trying. But in this scenario, like your lifestyle is that bedrock. If that bedrock's not st safe and sound, you're not going to be able to build anything on top of it, no matter how hard you try. And I bet she's seeing great progress of just now focusing on putting everything else into place because everything else becomes so much easier when that bedrock yeah. and that foundation solid. It's absolutely huge. And I think that kind of leads us Pretty smooth. Yeah. We didn't even do that on purpose. That leads us real freaking smooth into number five. To recap, because it's number five of the top five. Number one and two, probably the most common. You're either underestimating how many calories you're consuming or you're overestimating how many calories you're burning. Number three is you're not moving enough. Number four is the rest of your lifestyle flat out sucks. And number five, which I'm actually more excited because this is where when I run into a problem out of any of these five, this is it. I don't know about you, yeah. but this is always the one that I'm like, dude, get your, 
ish together. Yeah. You're not consistent at all. That's number five. You're not consistent at all. And the fact is meaningful weight loss takes months to years, not days to weeks. So if you're not consistent, who cares if you're consistent for two weeks, that doesn't matter. If you can't be consistent for the next year, you're out. I get really frustrated when there's a problem, but I can't like correctly label or identify it. I found this egocentric bias. And there's a couple other biases that kind of smoothly fit over the Dunning-Kruger, but that didn't really nail it. But the egocentric bias here, and this is something that I have a little personal story on too, is recalling the past in a self-serving manner. Meaning you overestimate the good and underestimate the bad that you have done in the past. And this can come in specifically when it comes to like training, nutrition, things like that. If you ask me, or you probably too, how are your grades in high school? I'll probably remember them a little bit better than they actually were if I had my report card right in front of me. Or if I went fishing with some friends a couple months ago and someone said, hey, how big was that fish you caught? I probably will remember, I'm not lying, but I'll probably remember the fish a little bit bigger as it actually was. And this is the same thing when it comes to training or eating well. It's like if you ask a lot of people, okay, out of the last 30 days, if you're tracking your calories, how many days did you stay under your calorie goal? They will most likely give you a number that's not just a little, but a lot bigger than actually happened. And this is funny because now this is the personal story is I used to work at, I moved out to North Georgia, to open up some Orange Theory Fitnesses. I worked at Orange Theory, which we actually talk about all the time years and years that's ago. so funny. I can't but picture it. Picture me with like a mic around my face, just yelling, are you ready? So what we would do though, is we do these challenges sometimes and I'd have clients come to me all the time and say, you know, I'm just struggling. Like, why am I not losing weight? Like I'm doing it. I'm working out five days a week. Why am I not doing it? I'm like, okay, let's just pull up your profile, whatever. It tracks every time that client would come to a class. And it's weird because they say they're working out five days a week. But when we look at the last few months, they've averaged maybe two or three workouts per week. And it's like, well, wait a second. I thought you said you were working out five days a week. Same thing with nutrition. If you say, how many days did I eat well out of the last seven days? You'll probably, and again, you're not lying. This is a bias in your brain that's just kind of filling this void. Is you'll remember that you did better than you actually did. And that's a big problem because you could think that you're tracking all your calories every day of the week. But if you're just conveniently forgetting that you go out on Friday and Saturday nights and you don't really track the massive amounts of alcohol you have, or you just underplay how big of a deal that is where you're eating a half a pizza and you're having three, four, five beers and two cocktails, and you're doing all this two nights a week. But when you remember the last month, you're like, man, I maybe went out like once or twice when in reality it was every single weekend. This one knocks people off. Oh and this goodness. is every few months I'll go through and start weighing out and tracking my nutrition again, just to make sure I'm where I want to be, or if I'm ever dialing in for a deficit or a surplus. And after four days in my head, I'm like, holy crap, I've been tracking my food for like two, three weeks. And I'm like, dude, it's literally been four days. <laughs> it feels it's so drawn out. <laughs> it feels so drawn out when this happens. This is the one that always I have to call myself out on hard. Yeah, I always, I struggle with that. It's human nature to struggle with something that feels uncomfortable. And getting back into the habit, especially when it comes to tracking your calories, being consistent with weight loss, like... It is not human nature to think about that. You have not been wired since you were growing up to have to consciously think about that. Anything mm -hmm. that you have to consciously think about again or newly is going to be difficult. And so yeah. it feels in the beginning, especially a lot, a lot harder than it turns out to be once it becomes more habitual. But I used to see this all the time when I really struggled with binge eating. And this was more so in the times when I was recovering from under eating, trying to figure out my hunger fullness cues, but still in that cycle of yeah. not eating enough or little to nothing throughout the day and eating so much at night and experience would be, I was telling Tony about this earlier, but I remember mul on multiple occasions eating this. It makes me so happy that the thought of it makes me sick now because I never thought I would get there, but eating an entire jar of peanut butter, right? I've had mm. the same peanut butter jar in my apartment for the past like three months and I don't think about it. But then it was like, if I ate that whole jar of peanut butter, the mental math I would do in my head to say, well, you actually ate very little 
all day. Mm. You ate nothing. You didn't even eat breakfast or lunch. So this is just going to count for that, which one, a whole jar of peanut butter? <laughs> no. But I genuinely, in my head, that gave me peace of mind and I believed that. So if you asked me if I recalled whether or not that would be a binge, I'd be like, oh, no, that wasn't because technically I didn't eat that day. Yeah. Which part of that was a, a mechanism for me to kind of move through it and allow myself to eat the next day, which was a good mm. thing so that I wouldn't fall back into that cycle. Mm. But that's crazy to me. I genuinely believed it. I wasn't lying to yeah. m myself. or I really thought that to be true in, in yeah. my head. <laughs> yeah. If you would have gotten hooked up to a lie detector test, you would have passed. If you said, yeah. do you binge? No, it, you would have probably passed. This is a bias inside your brain and it sucks. But you just got to come to the terms in some area or another of your life. You're probably just not as good as you really think you are yeah. when it comes to consistency, which I think is kind of a humbling, good thing to have. And if yeah. you want to test yourself out on this, this is a, a really cool tool I use. Now, you and I use like the Trainerize software is what we use with our one-on-one -on -one clients, which really does a phenomenal job so with good. nutrition, with training, with any sort of habit formation on tracking this out. But essentially does this in like an app versus what I'm about to say, this tool that I recommend everyone use is if you feel like, okay. I feel like I'm eating well. I feel like I'm training. I'm not overestimating. If you're checking all the boxes, do this. Print out a blank calendar for the month of March or whatever the next month is. Print out a blank calendar and choose one thing that you're going to track or maybe two calendars if you want to do a training or nutrition one. But a nutrition one for this example. Example: If your goal is weight loss and you know you need to be hitting, let's say, 2,200 calories a day to do this. And this is a simple example, but play it with me. For 30 days straight, or I think March has 31 days, right? At the end of every single day, just put it next to your bed and put a red marker next to it. If you stuck to your calories, cross that day off with a red Sharpie. If you did not, and make it black and white, if you had 2250, if you had just a little bit over, leave that day blank. Leave that day blank. At the end of 31 days, go back and look at how many X's are actually on that calendar and a lot of the times it is eye opening to people to see how few X's there really are. They forget, oh, well, I, you know what? I just got hungry that night and I had a little bit extra and I, I ate 23, 2400, but I still didn't get the X, right? So, but they don't count that in their head. Or, oh, you know what? This weekend my sister came to town, so I didn't track on Friday, Saturday. Cool. It surprises people because all those small things that are yeah. reasons, excuses, whatever you want to call them, they just kind of like wave off, but we don't really realize how many of them there tend to be do that, print out a calendar and do that. And that was a simple example for calories, maybe protein, maybe it's your workouts, but at the end of the month, really do a test on yourself and say, how consistent was I and how consistent did I think I was? And usually those two aren't the same. Yeah. And I think that's a really cool tool to call yourself out. Cause I think that's fun. Cause a lot of people are like, Oh, it's going to make me feel bad. It's going to do this. You it's found out what you're missing. It's that yeah. you're just not doing it. And that's you know? a mindset piece, right? Like looking at it as this is going to help me see where I'm falling back. I'm missing the mark and something I can tangibly work on versus, oh, this is a reflection of me as a person and it means I'm not good enough or never going to be able to do yeah. that. That is the mindset piece that this, it, it's important to have in order for this to work. I do this with my clients a lot on those days where you hit write down specific things that worked write down yeah like look back at the the meals that you ate the composition of your meals look back at how you were feeling that day reflect on that and see if there are any patterns that you could pick up on and make consistent or start to prioritize it, it gives you something to work with versus just going in blind and make making things up as you go. I've never even thought about that, but I love it because you, you yeah. don't remember those small feelings and those small things that you did at the end of the day. You're like, oh, this worked. Yeah. Write that. That's a great idea. Write it down because those mm -hmm. things work for a reason and they might be the missing piece when you kind of go yeah. into it. You and I have both dealt with this with a client here or there, not very often, but there's always these people. I know any coaches listening, I know the name will probably pop in their head. But you get a new client and let's say, and this is again, you've gone through all the background, they're at a place to track their calories and macros, for example, right? You've got their, the rest of their lifestyle figured out. You got their training figured out. So maybe now they're at this place and you say, okay, here's the calorie macro breakdown that we're going to hit. And we do a month and there's not much progress made in terms of weight loss. And they say, okay, let's change the nutrition. But you look back and it's like, well, you didn't track 10 or 15 out of those days. You, out of the, the 15 days that you did track, 
you blew your calories out by, you know, three or four of those days, you were only at consistent 30% of the time. We don't need a new nutritional setup. We just need to do the first one in the first place, right? It's always so funny because you look back and it's like, you don't need a new diet. You don't need a new this. You just need to do the yeah. one that should work in the first place. And so many people forget that's an option. They're like, oh, I wonder if it's my hormones. I wonder if it's because I, I'm not tracking, right? I wonder if it's X, Y, or Z. It's like, maybe you're just not doing it yeah. at the end of the day, which always makes me laugh a little bit. Mm -hmm. And now I'm thinking yeah. about, I think, would you rank that if we had to put, because these weren't in any particular order, I would put number five as, the, as number one. Yeah. It's like the now going I would through say this. so too, because with all of these, with all of the other things we listed, you need consistency. It's kind yeah. of like another foundation next to, we talked about the calorie deficit. Like you need to be consistent. The two go hand in hand. If you don't have consistency, I cannot figure out why, but- it is so intuitive for people to think about consistency and getting better at anything, whether it's in school, whether it's in their yeah. job, whether it's in their relationship. But when it comes to weight loss, Serious. the same amount of emphasis that you put on yourself for consistency is, is not there all the time. And that blows my mind. That is a but. weird concept because you're right. Like if someone, if it's like, okay, hey, go learn how to play piano. And this is the analogy that's probably not going to connect to a lot of people because I don't know how many people play piano. If, if I want to go learn how to play piano and I've got a recital in three months, and I say, okay, I got to practice Monday through Friday. And I know I'm not doing that. I don't automatically expect myself to be better. Yes. Where with this, with weight loss and stuff like that, it's like for some reason you expect it to work, even if you're missing the days out, which again, buckle up. And that's why we try and make it as sleep fit into your lifestyle as possible where you shouldn't notice that much friction with your nutrition or your training. This stuff should fit into your life because you're going to be doing it for a long time. And anyone listening with like a long way to go, who over the last 10 years has put on maybe 20, 50, 100 plus pounds, you got to remember like, if you walk 10 miles into the forest, you have to walk 10 miles back out. You can't yeah. skip that. Or to any coach listening who has a client on a longer journey, setting that expectation is huge. Where if you've been putting this on, for the last five or 10 years, if your lifestyle and habits have built to where you are right now, over the last five to 10 years, it's not something easily reversed. So it's something that you got to really chip away at day in and day out. And that, I mean, honestly, is kind of more comforting because if you miss a day, who cares? Yeah. It's one day, just don't miss two in a row. Just keep going back on it. You and know, if you realistically look outward and you're like, oh my goodness, like my mental health is actually much more debilitating than I thought. My job is making it hard for me to want to get up in the morning and want to do anything good for myself. My relationship, the environment, what I'm doing every single day is crippling me. It's not that it's easy to get out of, but don't it, put all of your energy into trying to be in just a calorie deficit, being really extreme, really consistent. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a much longer road, but if you put your energy first into those pieces that are preventing you from doing good for yourself, Eventually, it will be easy to find things that are easily fit into your life yeah. because you want to do good for yourself, right? Like 100%. there's only so much you can do within the environment you've put yourself in on a day-to-day -day basis. And it can be really, really limiting. And I didn't want to not mention that because yeah. there's some – you tell – like I was there I think this time last year and my life revolved around being – just wanting to go to bed because my job mm -hmm. made me absolutely miserable. And I know this is so relatable for so many people and it makes it hard to want to do anything good for yourself. And if you yeah. have something like that weighing over you, that doesn't make you feel like you're capable of being consistent at doing something that's good for yourself, address that hurdle. It's not going to be quick. It's not going to be easy, but put your time and energy into that. Yeah. Cause long-term that's, going to be worth it. It might be like the biggest mountain you ever freaking climb, but it's, it's going to be worth it. Yeah. This is such a freaking wholesome episode. I know. I like it. I like these. <laughs> a little hug inside. But I think that does put an end to our top five list. The top five reasons you're not losing weight when you think you need to be. And again, if one of these struck a chord with you, maybe listen to that section over again, pay attention to it a little closer, address it because we both, again, took our time separately and came up with the same five reasons. So it's yeah. pretty confident to say, if you're not losing weight when you think you need to, 
there's a 99% chance that one of the reasons is found somewhere within those five. So pay it yeah. close attention. Just a little reminder, if you have something specifically like pertaining to your experience that we didn't address here, that's what our Ask Me Anything segment is for on yes, our Fitness please. Desk Premium. You could go ask those questions anonymously and we're there to answer them. So that's, that's a big piece to find people like to take advantage of that. So that's another resource you have. And then coming at you quick, special announcement for everyone else. At the time of this recording, actually, but at the time this podcast comes out this coming Monday, Mariana is actually going to be in Southern California, flying out here in LA, San Diego, doing a little podcast tour, recording a lot of stuff. Y'all are going to have to work with us because we're going to record for the first time ever in person, sitting at the yep. same table, the which I think is going to be hilarious and goofy and we're going to sound a little stupid on the first one. So I think it's going to be funny. Yeah. But next time you hear us, we should be in person. And that's a wrap. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Fitness Stuff for Normal People. As always, you know where to find us, fs.pod on Instagram and TikTok, and Fitness Stuff for Normal People on YouTube. For more evidence-based content from Tony and I, make sure to check out our research review available on Fitness Stuff Premium every Friday, linked in the show notes below. And we hope this major Monday stuck a little bit less in the fitness industry, a little bit more bearable. We'll see you guys next week. <laughs>